So happy Thursday, everyone. <laughs> so, did anybody miss the lecture, the last lecture, the first one? Everybody? Did anybody not get the printed copies of the syllabus and the lecture notes last time? So a few. So I printed out ten copies of the lecture notes from last time in the syllabus. So only take a copy if you didn't get one last time. Yeah. So there should be enough for for everybody. Does that make sense? I'll, I guess I'll just pass these around. Are you the first person that didn't get it? In the Okay, so only take a copy if you didn't already get a copy last time. There are copies on Blackboard, but I, I just printed out 10. So I, I guesstimated that there are like five or six people that didn't get copies last time. <coughs> this is the attendance register. I know there's that machine over there, but I'd like to see also how it looks with respect to the intranet, what the intranet says. So this is what the intranet says. If you see your name on here, you're enrolled, and please sign. If you're not, then please add your name and sign. Any questions before we get started? So I know you're all excited about what's in my hands right now. <coughs> you might want to use my psychic powers to guess what's in my hand. Does anybody here like to practice psych psychic powers? Their psychic powers. Well done. See, see. So the first assignment. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was a master's student and I showed up to the first lecture on Monday morning, you know, at 9 a.m. And the first thing that was given out before any words were spoken at all was the first assignment. <laughs> and then I had another lecture right afterwards and it's same thing repeated itself. The second assignment was given one hour later before any words were spoken. And I just thought, oh, that's a nice start. <laughs> so then I waited until the second lecture to, to hand out the first assignment. So this one is about information visualization. Let's do it better than Professor C. By the way, I printed out 50 copies of this assignment. I hope it's <coughs> the right number. So this is 15% of the module. Therefore, it's recommended you work on it for roughly 25 hours, or you allocate 25 hours of time to work on it. It's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot. It is, yeah, it is. It's, 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 if, for every 150 credits, I'm oh, sorry, for every 15 credits, you, you allocate 150 hours. And um, yeah, that's how it works out. The good news is the deadline is not until the Halloween. You can submit it earlier if you like, if you don't want it to clash with your Halloween party preparations. But it's due before Halloween, so. So, the problem statement in data chaos. So this is about data chaos, going from data chaos to the visualization cosmos. Professor C was approached by public health data, the public health <coughs> data administration, there's a URL there, to help them with a serious challenge. 
the National Healthcare Service of the NHS that we all know and love has collected a massive amount of healthcare data about national general practice profiles also known as CCGs or clinical commissioning groups in the UK. <coughs> the data contains information about each person that has visited a CCG service and the diagnosis that they have been given. The data has been collected for each CCG and it is in, there's a description of, of, of what's recorded for each CCG, for example, the distribution of ages, people, of the patients that visit each CCG, a practice summary, the prevalence of different health disorders, if you will, or, or health that's gone not in a non-ideal path, for example, coronary heart disease, stroke, heart failure, <laughs> that's a popular one. Cardio, uh, different kinds of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, <coughs> mental health disorders, respiratory diseases, chronic kidney diseases, and so on. Right. So there's the, those diagnoses, or the prevalence of those diagnoses, is recorded for each CCG. A CCG is a group of healthcare practices. So you, you have different healthcare services in each CCG. You might have hospitals, you might have GPs, a group of GPs in a CG, CCG, <coughs> and other health pharmacists, and so on. Right. In addition to each of those data attributes, you have them distributed over a number of years. So you have the prevalence, these diagnoses, for different years, 2011, for example, 2012, 2013, 2014. So there's a lot of data here. You have geospatial data, the map of the UK and the, C the location of the CCGs on the map. There are something like around 250 of them, 250 areas that the UK has been divided up into and these NHS practices are grouped into them. Then you have lots of diagnoses, like 14 different kinds of diagnoses. And you have time, <coughs> so they're divided up also into years. So it's really a challenge, this, this data set, how to visualize this kind of data. This is what you're going to be working on for assignment one. <coughs> It's a lot of complex, da complex data. In fact, it feels like data chaos. When you go to the website and you start to do just downloading the data is kind of is kind of awkward and confusing and hard to understand. It's not really like easy to download. It's not just press this button and download all the data in a zip file. It's not like that. Now, Professor C would like to gain, like to know if visualization can be used to gain insight into their data, or, or the public health, public health data administration. So this is a real world problem. This is actually real. So this is real data. That's a real web page. There are real people working there, and they really want to know what the data looks like. That's why they put it online. They're hoping somebody can help them. Like visualize it and figure out what's happening. That's why it's been released to the public. So it's our job to, to, to be heroes and, and show them, you know, what's what's hiding in there. As with any real world project, acronyms and special terminology are abundant. Thus, you may need to contact the the web page administrators or Google some NHS terms in order to gain understanding of just the, some of the terms and the terminology that's being used. You can also ask Doris Hain, a fingertips technical specialist for public health data science at the Public Health England, any questions. So I've put down her email address there. And there's the URL to download the data. <coughs> 
Professor C would like to gain and convey the insight contained in the data visually. The goal is to create visualizations that maximize our understanding of the data in addition to some obvious factual information such as what's the average size of each CCG, what does the distribution of, for example, cardiovascular disease look like, which kind of, which CCGs have the highest incidence of diabetes? All interesting questions. Not very difficult to find out the answers to those, though. Some of the less obvious questions are some things like, are there any patterns in the data? Can you find any patterns? Are there trends? Are there outliers? Is there something we can look at in terms of multivariate visualization? Can we is there a relationship between cardiovascular disease and diabetes, for example? Uh, do those somehow look like they might be related? Those are the less obvious questions. Professor C made some attempts to visualize the data using old-fashioned pie charts, bar charts, bubble charts, and line graphs. But he was disappointed by the results, which are not very insightful, not visually informative nor aesthetically impressive. Can we do better than Professor C? And then the requirements are there about the assignment. So you are required to select three or more appropriate visualization tools for visualizing the data set. You're allowed and encouraged to further abstract the data, but you can create your own groups of data, your own categories, and things like this. You can combine attributes together. You can add new data. You can derive new data. You can do anything you like, any changes you like to the original data set, right? You might need, might need to combine some spreadsheets together because there are lots of separate spreadsheets. Right? Your task is to produce five different visualizations which can convey some meaningful and hopefully interesting insight about the data. You are to do better than Professor C. That means you're required to use more advanced visualizations than line graphs, bar charts, pie charts, and bubble charts. So there's some more, more information there. And you have, for each of your five templates, you, oh, so your five visualizations, you fill out a template of information, right? So for each of your visualizations, you provide the following information, the visualization itself as an image, the type of visualization it is, the tool you used, to generate the visualization, the description of the visualization mappings. So, for example, what is size mapped to? What is color mapped to? What is position mapped to? What is it showing? And observations. Anything we can learn from the visualization you created. Right? And I've, I've been very kind and I even gave an example. So you can see figure one, which is a, it's called a comparison tree map. It's a visualization. It's not of this data, it's a different data set. But there you see a sample, a sample description using that template, right? The visualization type, it's figure one is a tree map. The tool that was used to generate it is called many eyes. And then there's a list of the visualization mappings. Each bottom level rectangle represents a car type in this particular example. The cars are grouped together by country that they're manufactured in. The position of each rectangle is determined by decreasing frequency. So the more types of those cars there are, the more they're positioned to the left and to the top. The size of each bottom level rectangle is mapped to the difference in miles per gallon between the city and highway miles per gallon of each car type. 
In other words, each car in this case has a city, city miles per gallon rating and a highway miles per gallon rating. I don't know if anybody is here has ever tried to buy a car, but sometimes these properties are advertised. So this <clears throat> visualization looks at the difference between those two numbers. So cars that might get have a big disparity between the city and highway miles per gallon might jump out. And with this visualization, we can very clearly see, if you look at the color version, <laughs> there's one that sticks out, it's bright orange, and all the other ones are blue. It's in the top left. It's a, it's a Japanese car, and the Toyota is the only car with a greater efficiency in the city on the highway. There's just one car in that data set, and that jumps out immediately. When you, as soon as you visualize the, the data in that way. You probably wouldn't notice that without visualization. And, and you can make other observations too, like South Korea produces cars. I didn't even know that South Korea produced cars. And there are other observations that, that could be made from that. <coughs> You're encouraged to explore the use of digital maps. And there's some information about digital maps there. You'll find some information about maps on the, the, the healthcare website as well. They provide a map of CCGs for you. And you're also required to use three or more different tools. You can't just use one tool. You can use three or, or more different ones. And then part two is to create some three-dimensional visualizations. Visualizations that you can rotate in three-dimensional space. And there are useful links to visualization tools. If you look at the, the module webpage, you'll find links to, to lots of tools there. And there are some links here, but there are even more links on the module webpage. So, if I go to the database webpage, I, I found these recently, an amazing collection of data visualization tools. There are two. <laughs> so that's part of the challenge. There's a, there's a, that's a little bit like data visualization tool chaos, actually. But that, that, there are some collections of tools, and then I have a collection down here as well information visualization applications. So that's part of the challenge is to navigate this massive jungle of tools. That's part of the challenge. So you have to navigate the massive chaos of data. That's a challenge. The, the, the massive <coughs> space of tools. The, the big space of visualizations that they, they produce, although I wouldn't say that's such a huge, huge challenge. Figuring out the format that, that each tool requires to read in the data, that's a challenge. Understanding the data itself is a challenge, like when you download it, it's, it's going to look a little bit strange at first to try to figure out what all the numbers actually are. So those are three major challenges that will take a long time. So don't try to do this in the last evening. It'll require multiple sittings. Like one sitting just to download the data and figure it out. You know, another sitting just to just to, to look at the visualization tools. Right? And then maybe another one to figure out to start trying them. And then another sitting to to, to create the visualizations and another one to actually write the report, something like that. Any questions about the assignment? It sounds very exciting, doesn't it? It's, it's very different than a lot of your other assignments. This is very applied. There's no theory. Well, there's, it's not like there's no theory here, but it's very applied. You're getting real data, you're look, trying to solve a real problem with real tools. And there are real people involved 
it's it's you'll you'll notice that a lot of your assignments are very theoretical. The majority of your assignments are very theoretical. This is very applied. Question. In the uh, submission section. Which section? Submission. Submissions. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, there is a line like. Uh, on third line, it is to show five uh, visualization, each of which is accompanied by a caption with 250 <coughs> words. So, yeah, so you don't worry too much about that. Just think of that template that, that that's described on page two. There's a description template. Think about filling that in for each visualization and think about doing it very similar to the example that's there because I'll be I'll be looking at your visualizations and checking each part of the template essentially and you get you get points every time you you fill in the template information correctly yeah does that make sense Any other questions? The, the excitement I'm getting from the audience is a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's a fun assignment. You, you know, it, it is fun, I think. It's a good one. I know all, all the students last year, they absolutely loved it. <laughs> okay. Did everybody, does everybody have a copy of the lecture notes? So the, even if the ones I handed out last time or the, 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 the 10 that I handed out today? <coughs> and a copy of the syllabus. How about the attendance register? Is that still going around? Wait, what happened to that? Is that the attendance register over there? Yeah. Okay. Maybe you can just shout or raise your hand when it's all signed by everybody. If anybody has comments or questions in the middle, you feel free to interrupt at any time. So, just a, a very, very quick, quick review of last time we talked about this amazing ubiquitous pattern of knowledge evolution in the big data story. We quickly introduced the topic, some examples, some visualization goals, and then we started to talk about the visualization pipeline. Right, that's the, those are the four standard stages of the visualization pipeline. We talked a little bit about data acquisition, data enhancement, and this is, I believe, is where we stopped the visualization pipeline or the, the phase three visualization mapping. So the input to the visualization mapping is the pre-processed data. So for assignment one, you now know exactly what it's going to be. Your enhanced version of the data that you download about the state of health in the UK. Is anybody curious what the state of health in the UK looks like? <laughs> I, I, I think it's an interesting question. And then taking the raw data, like the numbers, since it's finished, and then mapping it to sh visual shapes. Points, lines, edges, triangles, polygons, cubes, tetrahedra, <coughs> varying size, shape, color, and transparency. That's the visualization mapping. And we're going to talk about different lot. That's the. This is the focus of the module. This, this, the visualization mapping. How to do this? That's. This is the the focus. How do we compute different kinds of surfaces? How do we construct different kinds of glyphs? Maybe we, how do we lay out a graph and so on? How do we, how do we assign colors to shapes and transparencies and, and shapes and all these things? And then finally is it's phase four where we do our 
projection from maybe 3D to 2D or just some sort of two-dimensional rendering, right? And this is the topic of computer graphics, right? Has anybody taken computer graphics here, like the computer graphics one with Mark Jones? Some people have, yeah. So that's the, that's this, that's the visualization pipeline phase four. Right, there are things like visibility calculation, right, if, if things are hiding behind one another or occluded, objects are occluded behind one another, or if objects are coming off the screen, you know, then they get, there's a visibility calculation for, for all the objects. Shading could be a factor, compositing could be a process that we're going to talk about, animation could be involved. Right, these are all computer graphics topics. And we do we do talk a little bit about some of these. Not a lot, but a little bit. And these are the books that are also mentioned in the syllabus. <coughs> Any questions about the first lecture? It's an exciting first lecture, isn't it? And now we'll look at the second one. <coughs> the attendance. And there'll be a so from now on there'll be the optional lab. <laughs> to help with the assignment. So the amazing <coughs> Richard Roberts is going to help us in the lab every Tuesday morning right from now on. Okay, so this part is about data. And between now and the 31st of October, you're going to learn about lots of different information visualization strategies that you can incorporate into assignment one, <coughs> the first assignment. So here we're going to talk a little bit about data and data characteristics and data dimensionality and some examples and a little bit on color, a little bit about color. So this module is rather data centric. So it, it's really, the data is a sort of a focal point of the visualizations. That's not necessarily always true about all visualization modules. Some visualization modules have a human-centered <coughs> point of view, where we start with the human visual system and then we work back to the data. The pipeline goes in the other direction. Here we start with the data. <coughs> And the, the, the person is at the end of the pipeline, so, so, so to speak. So we need to figure out the dimensionality of the data and what that means. Where does the data come from? Which visualization methods make sense? Why was the data collected in the first place? These are all important questions. And what would the user like to learn from the data? These are all important questions for any visualization you, you are working on. And for assignment one, you know, you know the answers to some of these questions already, like where did the data came from. You know a little bit about why the data was collected, but a little bit mysterious is the dimensionality and which visualization <coughs> methods make sense. And what would the user like to, to, to learn? Those are the mysterious parts. So the term dimension is confusing, actually. If we say data has a dimensionality, that sentence means two different things depending on the context. So in scientific visualization, data has a dimensionality and space has a has a dimensionality. So for scientific visualization, we're usually talking about spatial data, Euclidean space. 
And data is usually one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional. Does anybody know what one-dimensional, a one-dimensional <coughs> object looks like? Like, how would you describe one dimension in, in space? Who said that? <laughs> Teresa? A point. Close. Any other guesses? A line or an edge. So a point, anybody know what dimensionality a point has? Zero. Zero. <laughs> I forgot I could put that there, zero. Z I should put zero D here, and then one D, and so on. So zero D is a point, one D is a line or an edge, two D. Who wants to guess it? Two D. Surface. surface. What kind of a surface? Because there are different kinds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lower, upper, or... <laughs> a planar surface, a flat surface. Yeah, that's that's what we usually think of as 2D. I'm not going to ask you about 2.5D next. Three dimensions. Anything? Your laptop. <laughs> well, may, maybe. I wouldn't say anything. I, I would use a special kind of description of, of 3D. It's not 0D, 1D, 2D, for example. Now, 0D, 1D, and 2D objects fit into 3D space. But then, uh, I wouldn't say they're the same. Anybody want to take a guess? 3D what? has depth. 3D has depth. Correct. Yeah. It, it's the added dimension of depth or, or volume. It's volumetric data. So this projector is a 2D display. If it was 3D, we could add the depth on there. Right? And 2.5D, sometimes we use this term to mean surfaces in 3D. Not flat ones, but curved surfaces in 3D. It's sort of like halfway between 2D and 3D. There's a curved surface in 3D. It does it does require a volume to, to display, but it's infinitely thin, so it doesn't actually take up space, so to speak. It can be folded into a flat, into a flat surface, usually. <coughs> then we have instantaneous or time-dependent data. Does anybody understand those terms already? Anybody want to take a guess at what instantaneous and time-dependent data are. I think some people in the room do know this already. I'm going to use the power in my hands now. Emma Asplund. Emma, do you want to take a guess at what that means? No. <laughs> Well, I'm glad we're here because it's important that you know this. <laughs> I'm glad we're going over this. Anybody else want to take a guess? The computer scientists, the undergrad, the, the ones that did their undergrad in computer science here, really should know this. Anyways, anybody want to take a guess? If it's instantaneous, then it's, then it doesn't require an extra dimension to represent its fluctuation. Correct. What's your name? Matthew. That is correct. So there's time-dependent data, which data that changes over time, and time-independent data, data that doesn't change over time or has no time dimension. So assignment one, what do you have in assignment one? Time-dependent data. It's changing over time. You can also, the analogy I like to use is, is if you use a, a camera and you take a photo, that photo is time independent, it's instantaneous. A selfie is an instantaneous photo, right? If you take a video of yourself, 
Are those popular yet? No, not yet. A time-dependent video is, is you know, time-dependent. A video is time-dependent. A photo is time-independent. And scientific, this, this type of data usually represents a physical phenomenon. That means a phenomenon you can find in nature. Like if you were trying to visualize a tree, or a person, or a, flu, a river, or anything you can find in nature. So those are the dimensionalities for scientific visualization. In information visualization, the term dimension means something else, since there is no inherent spatial reference for information visualization. It's like it's abstract data, and the spatial arrangement is usually designed or derived. So a pie chart is information visualization. A bar chart is information visualization. So those, in that case, the space has been derived or designed for that data, right? And examples include databases, text spreadsheets, surveys, <coughs> monetary data, call center data, and so on. So the term dimension in this case means an attribute of the data. So imagine you had a spreadsheet <coughs> of cars, information about cars, the first column would be like the name of the car, the second column might be the year it was manufactured, the third column is obviously the color of the car, fourth column is the city miles per gallon. Each one of those columns is a dimension of the data or a data attribute. So you can have an arbitrary number of data dimensions for information visualization. You can have different kinds of data, right? So we can have scalar data. Does anybody know what scalar data is already? <coughs> no. Numbers. Numbers. And so we have numer different kinds of numeric data, natural numbers. <coughs> Anybody know what natural numbers are? It's a funny zero. term. Non-zero numbers. It's not. Positive non-zero numbers. Positive non-zero numbers. Any any other characteristics of those numbers? Non-decimal. Non-decimal. That's correct. Who who knew that? Well done. Well done. What's your name? David. How did you know that, Dave? <laughs> So yeah, the numbers you can count on your fingers, for example. <coughs> and there are integers. Anybody want to guess? <laughs> they include the negative, so it's like positive and negative natural numbers. Well, negative 1, negative 2, but they're still integers, so they're whole values. Then we have rational, <coughs> irrational, and, and so on. Anybody know what a rational number is? Actually, this is, this is not going to be a test question, by the way. It's just nice to, to review it a little bit. Rational numbers are any number that can be expressed by a fraction. So that includes all the numbers between 1 and 2, for example. Well, not all of them, but... Then there are there are real numbers and complex numbers and irrational numbers, right? the numbers that can't be expressed as a fraction and so on. That's not going to be a test range. And it's just nice to know that your data is complicated, right? There are also other kinds of data like vectors and tensors. We do talk about vector data in the third part of the module. Does anybody happen to know what a vector is? Correct. Who said that? Well done. It has magnitude and direction. So I'm driving, 
I'm driving 100 miles an hour, that's the magnitude, east, that's the direction. There's other kinds of data, non-numeric data like nominal, ordinal values and text, right? The library is a data set. You'll see that in assignment one you'll have some text data as well, some non-numeric values. And there's multi-dimensional or multi-attribute values, right? The columns in a spreadsheet, right? Imagine any spreadsheet, every row in the spreadsheet corresponds to an item, something, and then every column represents an attribute of that thing. And it's just easy to understand this car example. So every row is a car and then every column is some information or a data attribute about the car. Right? And the same is true about assignment one. So now we understand data dimensionality a little bit and data types a little bit. You have other characteristics like upper and lower bounds, the, the range of the data what the distribution looks like, the scale of the data, the size and resolution, right? big, small, microscopic, and so on. And then we want to figure out how to present the data. That's, that's, what we're, that's our job. That's what we're here for. If the data has an inherent spatial domain, so if it's scientific data, we probably are going to use some, some spatial visualizations for that data, right? If we don't have any spatial information, then we have to figure out what kind of space we're going to use to visualize the data, right? We have to figure out what the, which dimensions are used and for what purpose. What's the relationship between the dimensionality and the data characteristics? What kind of a presentation space do we have? This, I'm only using two-dimensional presentation space right now. We could be using 3D or 4D. Where, is there a focus? So is there some focal point? In other words, is some data more important than other data? This is usually true. So given a data set, usually there's some that's more important than other parts. So when you get an x-ray, the bones, your bones are the focus, right? As opposed to in the, the air around you is not very important. And that visualization, right? So that data is not very important. And is there anything that can be left out so that it implies that we put the important things, we leave in the important things, and we leave out the might leave out some of the things that aren't so important, or de-emphasize them somehow. And here are some examples. Is it warm in here? Is anybody else warm? I don't know if these windows open. Oh, yeah, they do. Let's just get a little bit of fresh air. If that gets too cold, let me know. In these examples, the N means any kind of data. It could be numeric, it could be non-numeric data. And this means one-dimensional. <clears throat> the R means real values or, or values, any, any numeric value like the rational values that we mentioned. And the one also means one dimensional. So one dimensional of any kind of data can be mapped to one dimension of real values. So this is an example. Right, a histogram is, is an example. You can plot any data set as a histogram, a set of bars, and then each bar has a height. That's in the height can be any value. Right, that's what we're talking about in this example. 
So bar charts, pie charts, histograms, bubble charts, and so on. In this example, we have a set of real values, one-dimensional real values being mapped to a one-dimensional visualization. So the real values are magnitude, and the magnitude is being mapped to a height. This is a time series plot. I think you've all seen time series plots before. This is, happens to be an example from marine biology. Right? And then somebody has selected an important part and visualized it up close. Right? So somebody has decided this is important, and so we're going to expand it. Here's an example of two-dimensional data being mapped <coughs> to a one-dimensional curve. So in this case, the data runs over two dimensions, and these curves, these are 1D lines. They're also called isocontours or contour lines. Does anybody know what an isocontour is yeah. or a contour line? I think there are some people in here that do know what those lines are. You've definitely all seen them before. Definitely. But you did, might not have known the name of them. Uh, similar to my superpowers, in that um, they, they like, the uh, line represents a value which is encompassed within the line. That's true, that's true. You're getting very warm. You're very warm. Where did you see them, do you remember? Um, meteorological forecasts. Exactly, when you watch the weather report every day. The temperature, um, we know that from the geography. Exactly, when you see the, watch the weather report, you see these lines, and these ISO contour lines. They're lines of constant scalar value. So the, va the, the scalar value is the same along these lines. So if you're watching the weather report, it can be temperature. The temperature is the same along this line. And the boundary you mentioned is the temperature on this side of the line is higher, and the time on this side is lower, <coughs> for example. It's usually, though, pressure that's shown as isocontours on the... Temperature. Yeah, temperature. Yes, and on maps. Height of mountain. Exactly. The, the, the lines of constant height on geographical maps. That's right. I think that's called the topography, the map topography. So you see those on, on maps. Yeah. By the way, this 2 is greater than 1. <laughs> so. There's been a dimensionality reduction here, so we've gone from two dimensions down to one. Here we have two-dimensional data being mapped to a two-dimensional visualization. So the two-dimensional data is two-dimensional vectors, and these vectors are also two-dimensional. They have a x position, a x and a y orientation. There is actually I could have put R3 here. Does anybody know what the third dimension being used here? We have X, like an X position and a Y position, but there's, there's one other thing actually being used here. Color, that's right. So I could have put a three there actually. And this is texture that's been smeared in a two-dimensional plane in the, in the in the direction of the flow. So this is some visualizations that you haven't seen yet. Like, no, probably none of you have ever seen anything like this exactly. But I think you've seen everything before up until now. Here is three-dimensional data being mapped to three-dimensional space. So these are three-dimensional glyphs, so they have x, Y and Z magnitudes. These are streamlines being mapped in three-dimensional space. 
and that's a stream surface. So that's another, that's a kind of surface that you've never seen before. You've probably all seen three-dimensional glyphs. Has anybody ever seen streamlines before? Probably a lot of you have not has ever seen a streamline. Anybody, anybody heard of a streamline before? Nobody's ever even heard of a streamline? Well, like I've heard that word before. A streamline is a curve that's always tangent to the vector field. And we're going to talk about those later on. Stream surface is a surface, a surface that's always tangent to the vector field. These are more examples. Three-dimensional set of numbers being reduced to a 1D isosurface. So an isosurface is a surface of constant scalar value. So every value on this surface is the same. And this is adding some transparency to the surface. This is fully opaque, and this is transparent. And this is, these are some examples we won't go into detail today. An arbitrary set of dimensions could be text data, could be numeric data, any kind of data being mapped to an arbitrary set of spatial dimensions. So in this case, all the data is represented by these lines. So this is a range of scalar values, another range of values, another range of values. And then they're, they're being mapped to heights. So there's a height here, a height here, and then they're being joined up, connected to each other. And we'll, we'll see some examples of that. And here we have a glyph. This is a a rugby glyph, <laughs> a rugby <laughs> visualization glyph. Anybody here watch rugby? We got one. I know there are more than one, one people in the audience that, that watch rugby. And I actually don't watch rugby, but we I've created visualizations of rugby games. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? <laughs> very sounds very exciting. Okay, we're almost, almost, yeah, maybe we'll stop here since it's getting close. Yeah, we'll stop. Any questions? Happy Thursday, if you Happy Friday, Eve.